I think for me, swimming is sort of my way of meditating, of recharging, of feeling like I'm taking control over a situation I don't have control over. So when Kim started swimming and exercising, I was really, really supportive because I know how the, the head feels after you exercise and, and the clarity that you have. Just being in the pool, having that buoyancy, it's cooling to the body, you don't have any pain, it doesn't hurt to walk. When I got my diagnosis, it was just another hurdle to overcome in life. And I think that I approached it that way. I remember sitting on the couch the whole week thinking, I don't want to just sit here and let it get me. I want to get it. You want to feel just that little bit of burn on the back of your arm. Kim's personality is one of just the fiercest determination my strong-willed personality. I'm not gonna succumb to something. I'm gonna fight and I'm gonna put the gloves on and it's gonna be a go. My name is Kim and I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Back in 2022, I was living a normal life I was walking every day. Sometime in May, I started to notice that I seemed to be getting a little pudgier. Um, thought maybe I just need to, you know, kind of fine tune what I'm eating and get a little bit healthier, but nothing seemed to be working. And her discomfort was at such a level where she made some calls to see if she could get in to see her GI doctor. And the GI doctor heard what she was saying and, and recommended that she go to an emergency room. So they had taken me in for a CT scan and they had run some blood work. And when the doctor came in, she sat down and said, uh, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but you have cancer and it's everywhere. And I remember listening to my husband cry next to me, but I sat there completely emotionless. And I think at the time it was just so shocking that that could possibly be the case that I just said, okay, Okay, and she kept looking at me like, this is not the response I expect from someone who I just told they have cancer. You hear the diagnosis, you're hearing the words, you race in a million directions all at the same time and none of them are leading you anywhere. So at that point, they admitted me into the hospital to help ease some of my symptoms and see if they could figure out a little bit more about what kind of cancer it was. In general, the epithelial ovarian cancers usually present with some nonspecific symptoms, some bloating, increased abdominal girth, increased gassiness, more constipation, uh, not being able to eat as much as usual. Uh, those can be things that happen in normal everyday life uh, for a period of times. And unfortunately, usually when those symptoms are there, the disease has already presented itself in a metastatic way. Based on the x-rays and CT scan, it showed an excessive amount of fluid both in my abdominal cavity as well as in the area around my left lung. So they performed two procedures, a thoracentesis and a paracentesis, which is just the way of draining the fluid. Early detection have been elusive for some reasons. In order to have an effective screening test, two things really need to be accomplished. One is you have to find a disease at a time point you can actually make a difference in someone's outcome. The other thing is it has to have such a good predictive value to the test that you are not harming patients that have false positive test values. And neither one of those are true right now for ovarian cancer. When I was discharged from the hospital, I was contacted by Moffitt and Dr. Wenham's office to schedule me for a consultation to go over what was going on. He just knew he needed to get me started on treatment and asked how soon I wanted to start chemo and I said, I could stay today if you want me to. I really remember that time. And I remember that she, she turned and she started crying which at that point in time was not something that Kim typically did. And I remember her saying, I think I'm okay. 
with understanding that I might die. But I'm not okay knowing that I won't be able to help the kids and answer questions for them in the future. And that was so incredibly hard to hear and motivated me to start taking on the day-to-day -day things that we do in our house and in our lives because I, I knew that if Kim was in a place like that early on, that she wasn't going to have the mental fortitude to battle and be who Kim is normally, which is this dynamic, determined fighter. So I knew that, that I was going to become more of a burden and really needed to rely on the family to help with everything around the house. But I think once they saw that mom was okay, that, that chemo wasn't taking her down, um, you know, they've sort of gotten back to that, that normalcy and that feeling of being a burden definitely wasn't there as much for me anymore. There you go, you look like me. There's two primary treatments for ovarian cancer. The first is surgical. We try to reduce the disease down to the minimal amount that it can be. And we really have some cutoff values we know that are important. During Kim's surgery, one of the notable things is that she did have disease spread throughout the abdomen, and even including up on her diaphragm, which is the area between the liver and the lung. Uh, after mobilizing her liver, I took out the parts of tumor that I could find on the diaphragm. So on the morning of my surgery, when I was in pre-op, they put an IV in and started the Cytolux. The Cytolux then is in your system when you go in for surgery. Cytolux, also called papillocyanine, is a infrared dye that's been attached to an antibody. And that antibody goes after something called folate receptor alpha. Now, we don't typically see a lot of folate receptor alpha on normal healthy cells. But it turns out that certain cancers, such as ovarian cancer, happen to have a lot of that on their cells. We are able to use this dye given before surgery to go in there and use a near-infrared camera after we think we've taken out all the tumor. And it turns out that about one in three or one in four patients actually have additional clinically significant tumor we would have left behind if we'd only used our eyes and hands. I had a total hysterectomy with debulking and removal of other cells as well. So he was able to remove an additional, I believe, five or six areas of cancer within my abdominal cavity. The other treatment for ovarian cancer is chemotherapy. And so we have some standard chemotherapies that we use to treat it, and then we have some tailored therapies depending upon the genetics of the patient and the tumor. The last chemotherapy was definitely um, one I will never forget. It was emotional because I was in the same center that the very first chemotherapy took place in. And on the very first day I had chemo, my husband and I were getting ready for them to start the chemo and we, someone got to ring the bell on that first day and I remember we both just sobbed, knowing that at some point I would get there, but was I really gonna get there? And so on that last day, um, my family came, my mom, my sister, um, friends, uh, and everybody was waiting at the bell. And I just remember being on FaceTime actually with several others who couldn't be there and running over to the bell and just, it just felt so good to ring that bell. Well, for the type of ovarian cancer that we're talking about, the general risk factors are th those things that increase the number of ovulatory cycles in the lifetime for a woman. So early age of uh, menarche, late age of menopause, very few children, lack of breastfeeding. Now that's probably true for most of the, the garden variety types, but there are some genetics that we know can drive and increase that risk uh, beyond that which is seen in the general population. Kim does not have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, but when we tested her tumor, it actually had something called homologous recombination repair deficiency. About half of ovarian cancers will have that, 
and it's a good thing for treating patients because now we have something to target it called PARP inhibition. This ovarian cancer treatment has come a long way in years, and I feel that I was left in the best possible situation once I had the surgery and the cancer removed, going through the, the six chemotherapy treatments I did, and now being on my PARP inhibitor, I am very hopeful. So currently we're in a large amount of exploration of immunotherapy type drugs. In fact, we even have a very novel CAR-T trial, which is where we take patients' immune cells, re-engineer them to go out and find cancers. And I'm pretty optimistic that sometime before I retire that we're going to have some good breakthroughs. I've been an occupational therapist for 23 years, and I own my own clinic. I had started going to my online program for a doctorate in occupational therapy back when COVID first struck when this whole cancer thing happened. Very lucky to have the staff that I have at my office because they all stepped in. Uh, not one of them didn't ask, what can I do to help? And then through it all, the professor that I had been working with was like, hey, on your good days, just keep working and we're gonna get this thing done so that you can graduate in December. And I did. My mom is one of the biggest inspirations to me. She is you know, such a motivation in the fact that she was able to complete her doctorate while having ovarian cancer and going through treatment is insane to me. And it, I find it so inspirational. Which of the following animals gives birth instead of laying eggs, will, ostrich, or platypus? The positivity that she ex exudes is what keeps her going. She not only is positive about conquering this, positive about her good health, positive in every way she can, but she's sharing it with everyone she can. And that's difficult for most people, and she just does a tremendous job of moving it forward. Yeah. Wine is served. Right now, Kim's doing very well after treatment. She remains on maintenance, targeting with that PARP inhibitor because of her HRD. Uh, she currently has no signs of the cancer that we can detect. And of course, Kim is very active, and so she's out living her life like she should. Kim's health today is as good as I've seen it. Um, she is active, positive. Uh, you notice that she, from time to time, has periods where she's tired or maybe not at that 100% level, uh, but Kim not being at 100% is most of our 100%. I would like to inspire hope um, for any woman who's possibly going through something like this. There, there is a positive way to handle the situation, to go through chemotherapy. It doesn't have to own you, it doesn't have to define you. You can own it and you can take control and do the things you can do to get through it positively.